<laughs> All right, so it's 3.35, so let's get started. So I want to welcome uh, Alessandra Necki, um, who is joining us um, from the Max Planck Institute. So a little background on Ale, she got her PhD in 2012 from Padua University, and she did uh, a couple of postdocs, at, one at Utrecht uh, University, one at Ali, I have never read your whole CV before. Wow. <laughs> um, then, then she was in um, Belgium for a while. Then she was a Marie Curie at, uh, fellow at CERN. And now she's currently a senior postdoc at, Ma at Max Planck Institute for Physics, um, which is pretty recent, I think, uh, for the last year, right, Ali? Yeah. About? Last October. Yeah. Um, so, anyway, uh, she's going to talk to us today about quantum gravity. So, um, go ahead, take it away, Ali. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction and uh, for this invitation. Um, I uh, would like to um, take you on a, on a um, ride with me on uh, uh, some recent developments on uh, um, understanding the fundamental properties of gravity. Uh, and uh, uh, the interesting part, I think, uh, of the recent uh, research in the last uh, few years is that uh, um, we can actually uh, look at uh, uh, phenomena at low energies uh, with a new eye, uh, with the uh, new uh, physical principles um, uh, that we uh, believe are uh, proper of, of gravity, of a UV complete theory of gravity. So uh, this is the, the theme of uh, the talk. And uh, yes, please interrupt me at any point. Uh, uh, I have a few slides. Uh, um, you sorry uh, i'm saying we can we can take it at whatever speed we want uh, uh, what i really hope is that uh, you can get some of the concepts uh, um, uh, from the talk so please ask questions okay the uh, outline of the talk my tablet is responding uh, um, i mean uh, um, i will uh, work in the context of string theory uh, string theory is an interesting and uh, a powerful tool uh, that allow us to uh, treat uh, a theory uh, that is a theory of gravity and is UV complete. So for me, string theory will be the framework where I can address questions about quantum gravity. Um, I will focus on uh, two uh, main uh, results. <coughs> The uh, first one is uh, uh, recent developments on the Swampland program which is related to um, understanding properties of low energy effective field theories uh, uh, related to, um, and then I will explain what it is, the string landscape. Uh, essentially, uh, we want to answer the question, why not all quantum field theories can be realized from string theory? So why not uh, all low energy quantum field theories can come from a UV complete theory of gravity? And the second uh, part of the talk will deal more with uh, black hole evaporation. Black hole evaporation is a phenomenon that uh, uh, is proper of low energy gravity. We see black holes and uh, they are solutions of a GR. We can treat them semi-classically and we uh, understand that they must evaporate and we can treat this evaporation uh, semi-classically. So there's no need to go uh, to the UV to, to see uh, phenomena like black hole evaporation in our theories. However, to understand them fully, uh, we uh, need to ex go beyond our uh, knowledge of gravity as general relativity. So I will try to uh, tell you what we've learned recently about black hole evaporation and uh, uh, more precisely about how it can be a unitary process. And I will briefly mention the open problems at the, at the end. So let's, uh, let's start from uh, the obvious, uh, um, uh, let's say, uh, background. Uh, we are dealing with high energy particle physics and after um, a huge success in describing fundamental interactions as quantum field theories. The um, uh, from theoretical framework of quantum field theory has a, a a great predictive power, and uh, uh, we can um, use uh, Feynman diagrams as uh, the uh, computational tool that allows to predict uh, the probability for certain processes to occur for certain particles to decay. 
and these predictions have been tested uh, you know very well uh, by uh, also your contribution at uh, uh, accelerators. This is the great success of uh, uh, the standard model of particle physics. We've tested even too well. Uh, it fits all our uh, theoretical predictions. Uh, the uh, quantum field theory paradigm underlying our understanding of particle physics is basically that forces, fundamental forces are mediated by spin one fields, which act as gauge fields, and the matter that's charged under interactions, the matter that actually interacts is uh, um, uh, cons um, consists of spin zero and spin one half fields, fermions, and we now know also there's a there's a scalar, the Higgs boson in our in our universe. This is very successful but it does not include gravity. Why? Well, given that all interactions are mediated by gauge fields, we can imagine that also gravity is mediated by a gauge field. And in fact, we can describe uh, gravitational interactions as the exchange of a mediator, a spin to uh, symmetric tensor that has two physical polarizations. and. Uh, when two particles exchange this, this spin to field, the graviton, uh, if we resum the, we can write a perturbative um, interaction the same way we write the perturbative interactions in QED. And we can even reproduce uh, uh, perturbatively the uh, Newton potential as an exchange of graviton between massive particles. The problem arises when we go back to our Feynman diagrams and try to predict probability for processes to occur. Because these Feynman diagrams cannot be renormalized. There are certain divergences that appear when we try to make predictions to compute Feynman diagrams at every energies, at every loop, that prevent us from making any prediction. We would get infinite probabilities, which is, which is not physical. Uh, this is a big problem prevents us from coupling gravity to quantum fields dynamically. So we can only treat gravity as a background in this setup. However, we know in our universe that we have dynamical background because we have a cosmological evolution of the universe. And we know that we have quantum fields. So in order to try to avoid this problem, we can try a way out. And the way out that is, uh, let's say, um, taken by string theory is to um, go beyond uh, the idea of having local interactions. In Feynman diagram, we have vertices, we have uh, uh, loops, but uh, like vertices can be like three vertices, four uh, particle vertices, uh, but everything like is, is local. Uh, quantum fields have a dependence on, uh, on space-time variables and the interaction uh, is an event in our space time. With string theory, this changes. We promote particles from being point-like to being string-like or it's extended objects. This means that we don't have Feynman diagrams anymore because these strings don't have like world line in their time evolution trajectories, but they describe a world sheet. And when two world sheet collide, they describe two dimensional surfaces. So now our amplitudes are basically these two surfaces, these are these two surfaces, these kind of surfaces, where in this example, what we have is two strings that interact by joining and then separating again. These surface will compute a probability of interaction relating to interaction of these strings. So because the interaction is not just a point, but is a surface, this is enough for smoothing out the divergences of gravity. And what we get is a finite uh, result. The, we give up locality, so the interactions become non-local, but this theory of strings is predictive, has no divergences, and is a UV complete theory of gravity. The, what are the particles? Why is this theory of strings related to our world at all? Because as a rope or an elastic cord or like a violin string that we can make vibrate, the 
particle, the, the string, these strings vibrate, their normal modes, their quantum states are given by excitations, these vibrations, and the lightest states or of the or these lightest uh, vibrations are in fact point particles. If we look at what are the lightest point particles, in particular the massless ones, they, we expect to find the gauge fields because we know that gauge fields are massless. And in fact, among the light excitation of the strings, we find the gravity uh, spin two fields, uh, some scalars, and spin one fields that are all massless. So this tells us that in this setup, we recover the fundamental interactions as we know them, but we also recover a spin to graviton. So we also recover gravity. This, again, is a theory that's the, that is uh, uh, defined at all scales up to the Planck scale. There is a question the probability amplitude calculated using a Feynman diagram will have a dependence on the number of vertices. How does probability scale for the string theory? Um, the, uh, there is a string coupling constant, which is alpha prime. Oh, uh, this is a tree level amplitude. So it will have uh, the Strict you said that we can interrupt you, right? Yes, 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 please. Okay, can you please explain uh, in this approach which you are pointing out, uh, uh, can you calculate the coupling constant in this approach in the string theory? Yes, so the string theory uh, is essentially the uh, theory of uh, uh, how to embed this two-dimensional uh, world sheet in a 10 dimensional setup because the theory is consistent in 10 dimensions that's a caveat that i will explain later okay but, does it allow to calculate coupling constants you mean gauge coupling constants yeah yes of these gauge fields yes there is a, a, a overall coupling constant which is the, the 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 coupling constant between these strings these interactions which is uh, set at alpha prime that is uh, uh, somehow um, not fixed. So I, we, we don't, let's say, it's not that this interaction between the strings happen at the, max, at the Planck scale, at 10 to the 19 GeV. But there's an alpha prime, let's say, alpha prime uh, constant, that is the coupling constant of these interactions. So this is a, a vertex in the string theory language, and this will go like alpha prime. Uh, so there is no numeric prediction for that, but this is a parameter which can be introduced to describe it properly. It's, it's, it's the perturbative, param the parameter of the perturbative expansion of string theory. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your question. So yes, it is. It is uh, string amplitudes are a very developed uh, field of research uh, where people try to uh, both uh, make computations from the string world sheet as well as connect the uh, processes, the probability computed through string amplitudes to um, the low energy uh, quantum field theory probabilities of the corresponding low energy low energy limit. So we, we work with string theory and we can work at every energy scale, but we can also ask, and this will be the, the point of view of the rest of the talk, we can ask uh, what happens when uh, uh, we go to low energies, because this is uh, um, a string, but we said that if we look at the light excitations, so only those fields that survive when we go to very low energies, we can integrate out all the additional modes. At low energies, what happens is that this, we should see some theory of fields, some quantum field theory. We should not see strings at low energy. And in fact, most of the computations that we can do, geometric computations, uh, study of uh, systems from string theory are obtained in their low energy 
limit. We, we have the freedom to choose what kind of strings, open strings, closed strings. We can have additional higher dimensional brains. Uh, we, we can decide what are the fundamental ingredients and given their fundamental ingredients, we can go to low energy and find different quantum field theories that we can study and, uh, and we can investigate. As I mentioned earlier, the um, string theory has had a lot of like uh, um, successes and a lot of criticism, especially because if at the beginning it was seen as a possible unified theory of all the fundamental interaction, it was clear from the beginning that there were many problems. It is consistent in 10 dimensions. Uh, there are too many vacua. I cannot predict one single universe. You would predict uh, 10 to the 500 possible vacua or, or even more nowadays. Uh, it is formulated as a supersymmetric theory and we still haven't seen supersymmetry uh, in our universe. I think uh, Larry and Tova <laughs> would, <laughs> would look more happy than they are now if, if that was, uh, that was uh, if we had discovered supersymmetry. Um, uh, we um, cannot uh, uh, engineer whatever quantum field theory we want from string theory. In fact, we cannot engineer only the standard model from string theory. String theory does not predict the standard model. Uh, but uh, we can use uh, all these, uh, uh, we can see all this, um, uh, yes. <laughs> We can see all these downsides also on the other uh, hand as, uh, as uh, new possibilities uh, for, for theory because uh, uh, it is true that from 10 dimension we can see, uh, uh, we can construct uh, uh, product spaces of the four dimensional world we live in with some uh, what we call internal space, where all the dimensions are much, much smaller than the four dimension we see in our universe. So what I have here is the, just a cartoon where imagine that our, for our um, four-dimensional space-time uh, in each direction, we don't have uh, um, just one direction, but uh, additionally, at every point, we have a sphere that is too small to be seen in our at our energies. But if we were able to go to the UV, we would we would see additional geometry, additional degrees of freedom coming up. So this is the idea of compactifying internal dimensions. And uh, uh, needless to say. All this richness of vacua give us a lot of examples to study, and uh, we can address questions about quantum gravity directly. So I hope that I convinced you that uh, it is worth going through all this effort of uh, generalizing something so nice as quantum field theory in something so complicated as the non-local theory of strings and brains uh, to try to learn something about quantum gravity. And uh, uh, it was worth it. Uh, some of the major successes of string theory have been, uh, first of all, giving a um, quantitative example of holography and uh, uh, providing a quantitative counting of the black hole microstates. I know this thing may not say a lot to you. I will explain something later, but these have been very important, uh, important developments uh, in the theoretical physics. Uh, the, again, the point of view I'm taking today is, well, if we're interested on low energy phenomena, low energy effective field theories, string theory can still be an interesting tool that we can use to learn more about them. And uh, the two uh, lines of research that are very active today nowadays are uh, the Swamplan program and uh, uh, the uh, study of evolution of semi-classical black hole and their evaporation. So let me start by telling you something about, uh, about the Swampland program. And for doing that, I have to start with the string theory landscape. Why is there a, the a string theory landscape? Because string theory cannot predict just one vacuum. String theory has so many parameters that we can choose to, and we can obtain like so many different vacua that what we have in the end is a landscape of possible solutions of string theory. Landscape of possible it's, sorry, this is a landscape, uh, a landscape of uh, uh, possible um, solutions of the equations of motion of string theory. All these uh, um, vacua fit in all the possible quantum field theory that we can uh, study. There are some uh, theories, quantum field theories, that we cannot obtain from string theory or from a UV complete theory of gravity. And so 
the question we're asking is, from string theory, we can derive a lot of low energy effective field theory. If we just take uh, string theory, we look at its uh, low energy limit as a geometric theory. Uh, we compactify some dimensions. We go down to four or five, six uh, dimensional uh, supersymmetric theories. Um, we can we, we obtain some of them, but not all. And the question is, is string theory not capable of describing all quantum field theories or string theory is telling us that not all the low energy quantum field theory or not all the effective field theories are can be completed consistently in the uv by a theory of gravity and so if we take this point of view then we can look at what are the common uh, properties of all the quantum field theories that are part of the landscape so all these theories that can be derived from string theory, maybe directly because we've constructed them. And we can look at their properties and ask, what are their common properties? Because these properties may be properties that are come from a quantum gravity theory. And uh, these properties, if we assume they are actually constraints on uh, the low energy theory to come from a string theory origin, they uh, become important uh, tools to understand what what this landscape is made of and uh, and why only some theories can be coupled to quantum gravity. So let me go, be a bit more concrete. Uh, the Swamp Plan program is a, a program that looks at the landscape of uh, theories uh, that come from string theory and tries to develop a set of principles that tell us why an effective field theory is compatible with a theory of quantum gravity. These principles, and I'm listing some, but not all, because we're, we're getting conjectures uh, every, every few months. Uh, definitely the, uh, um, the one principle that we all agree on is that uh, there's no continuous global symmetry in quantum gravity. If we have particles or, uh, that carry a symmetry, this symmetry must be gauged in the UV. Uh, in the same way, recently it's been developed a cobordism conjecture for which uh, uh, two different theories of quantum gravity must be uh, able to be deformed one into the other with a finite action, which again tells us that we cannot associate a global charge to a certain quantum gravity theory. Uh, the weak gravity conjecture is uh, um, uh, was formulated in 2007, but recently in the context of, of the string theory Swampland program has been uh, revived. It tells us that gravity is the weakest force. Uh, the, it, has, uh, uh, it has to be in, in a UV complete theory of gravity, the gravitational interaction needs to be weaker than any gauge interactions, any Maxwell field, uh, any other Young Mills field need to have a coupling that's higher than the gravity one. Uh, other conjectures are the De Sitter conjecture and the ADS distance conjecture that tell us uh, various uh, various properties of, of vacuum of string theory. And there are questions so that maybe I should address. Um, no, we are, we are considering the QFTs. When I say QFTs, I talk about much more general theories than the standard model. Uh, they're just theories where we have um, in one gauge fields that can be abelian or non-abelian. They can be young Mills fields, uh, they can have confinement, uh, they can be strongly coupled, any kind that is a theory which is local, which has local interactions as spin one fields and matter fields, spin one half, etc. And uh, uh, most of the time it also has supersymmetry, but it's not a requirement. So if you want to say like the similar features to those of the standard model is to be a local theory of quantum fields uh, where interactions are mediated by spin one fields. Um, Alessandra. Yes. Uh, can you uh, just along those lines, uh, can you uh, give an example of a quantum field theory that uh, is not consistent with, with uh, a, 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 you know, a string origin? You mentioned that. Yes, you know. yes. For example, if we wanted to have a, like super young Mills theory, which is just a um, QCD uh, with uh, um, uh, supersymmetry, uh, 
QCD like. Uh, if we cannot have any uh, group SUN. Uh, QCD is SU3. We can just look for SUN groups uh, in general. And from string theory, we cannot have uh, any kind of gauge group. Uh, we are forced to have a certain matter content and a certain um, a certain um, gauge group. And the easiest example is probably just the standard model. We cannot get just the standard model. We can get uh, some of uh, the standard model gauge fields plus many more. Uh, or um, we can, uh, again, we have a certain discrete set of gauge groups that we can get. And the reason, the reason is uh, that the way we construct the low energy quantum field theory is that, uh, okay, I think it's easier here, is that we always have to construct uh, space times that have, uh, um, let's say, two factors. One of the two is the extended space time. So in this case, I write ADS7 because this is the example we were interested in, but uh, uh, it's four dimensions. Uh, let's say our universe is four-dimensional that we know of with low energies. And so there will be some additional from 10 dimension, six dimensional space that will be a convert space can be, you know, it's not going to be a sphere because we are dealing with a bit more complicated setup. Um, usually like spaces that have been studied a lot are Calabiao spaces. But the point is that these geometries that are internal geometries have certain characteristics. They're like algebraic properties. They're like homotopy groups. They, are, they have particular characteristics that, and these characteristics are what determine the gauge group of the resulting quantum field theory at low energies. So we have a finite number of quantum field theories because we have finite examples of geometries that we can compactify the 10 dimensions on. But all of uh, all of the uh, theories that you you can construct uh, do include all of the components of the standard model, no? Like QED, QCD, electro. Um, well, so sometimes they're just a one non-abelian sector, for example. Okay. Um, so we they not necessarily can all embed be um, not necessarily the standard model can be embedded in any QFT. Okay, got it. But we got can it. definitely cook up. That's some what I was asking. Me. Okay, but uh, you know, in in our as far as low energies are concerned, we observe the standard model. So, in some sense, uh, you know, the theory uh, in a way predicts uh, models that don't describe our world, right? Um, it describes a lot of worlds that are that work right. like our world they, it describes a lot of worlds where mm -hmm. fundamental interactions are, are of the same nature as the standard model it describes a lot of uh, worlds where fields are fields that we've we've found so i think that is why we are still interested in in this okay. in this uh, theory we want to see how quantum gravity is related to a world where the low energy interactions are mediated by gauge fields. And yeah. Right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks for the question. This was just, uh, I wanted to, to just briefly outline, but I'll go, I'll go quickly. Um, uh, a work that I've done recently where we studied, in this case, uh, a 10 dimensional geometry that has an internal space that is just three dimensional, something like uh, seriously <laughs> a sphere with, with additional like uh, brains that, that wrap uh, some hemisphere, making it look like a crescent and variations of these internal geometries. Uh, and uh, uh, we uh, were able to study gravitationally the geometry corresponding to the low energy theory that comes from uh, from uh, from these setup of brains. Uh, there's a strings and uh, extended object in string theory, which are D brains. And by cooking up certain uh, certain configurations, uh, we can assign, as I said, um, a superconformal field theory dual. So it's quantum field theory with supersymmetry. Uh, it's important to uh, understand properties of these uh, of these uh, 
super conformal theories. They're not easy to study. That's why people are researching them. And uh, the, we took an approach where we uh, were looking at uh, uh, the gravitational analog. We were looking at geometrically, if we go down in low energies and look at the geometry this, uh, that comes from string theory, we get a space, a curved space, an hyperbolic space called anti the sitter and an internal two-dimensional geometry. And by looking at the uh, these these uh, gravity equations, uh, these low energy theories, which are of the kind of supergravity, which is certain kind of fields, we were able to uh, reconstruct the whole hierarchy of uh, of superconformal field theories with different symmetries from the uh, UV to the IR, and. Uh, this was uh, uh, useful because we could also prove certain like instabilities of non-supersymmetric vacua because one of the criteria that string theory seems to tell us is that all the vacua needs to be supersymmetric otherwise they are metastable sooner or later they will decay and so we found uh, uh, perturbatively and non-perturbatively like uh, um, uh, reasons for these vacua to non-supersymmetric non-supersymmetric vacua to decay and this was a work that we did recently. Uh, we could also prove uh, in the context of the, uh, what I mentioned earlier, the ADS distance conjecture, that uh, basically it seems that string theory is telling us that all the vacua that we can co construct uh, that are uh, this kind of, uh, of product, uh, hyperbolic space times an internal space, we cannot make this internal space as small as we want. As I said, like we can see our four dimensional world as a four dimensional world where in addition, there's many or like six dimensions which are compact, they're compactified and they're tiny sized and we cannot see them. If we want to see the 10 dimensions of string theory as giving us our universe in fourth dimension by compactifying the remaining six dimensions, it means that when we have this kind of product space, this internal space needs to be small enough and it needs to be made small enough. And it seems that from string theory, there's certain like problems of creating a hierarchy between the size of the extended space. This would be our universe, our four dimensional directions are extended uh, and the internal space that should be small. So what we did was to compute in this kind of setup that we were able to, to write down explicitly the uh, size of this extended seven dimensional space, which is the radius of this hyperbolic space, and the mass of the um, spin to excitations. It's enough to find one example where this hierarchy is not there to say that we cannot uh, make this space as small as we want. And in fact, if we look at the masses, the tower of masses of spin two fields, um, we see that uh, e uh, they are defined in terms of this uh, quantum number L. And for L equals zero, we recover the graviton. And for L different from zero, we go up to numbers that are of the same kind of, uh, of uh, 42. Like we, we don't get like, I don't know, um, a thousand or 10 to the minus three. So there's no hierarchy. And so it seems we cannot really decouple the physics of this external space from the physics of this internal space. And this is an important, uh, important concept to understand from, uh, from string theory, if it's possible to create this, uh, this hierarchy of scales or not. Uh, Alexandra, yes. If I may, uh, is, has there been any dis uh, discussion? Is uh, things mature enough where uh, one can uh, discuss or investigate uh, how the compactification occurs? I mean, you know, does that happen classically uh, as per the or, uh, evolution of the universe where some dimensions shrink and others expand? Or it, does it happen in, in some other way? I mean, there, there are, you know, different possibilities, as you know. So have, has, has the theory uh, been looked at in that regard? Is it sufficiently developed that you know, one could take a, a quantum cosmological perspective uh, on it to, to understand that compactification? Um... Not that I know of, uh, but I think that uh, the um, uh, I think that most of the cosmology problems in in string theory are much before the problem. Um, uh, sorry, they 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 have let's say they have bigger problems than the compactifications <laughs> because the problem in string theory the is that yeah. the sitter vacua cannot be constructed, and so most of the cosmological efforts are in trying to understand if they can 
create a vacuum where instead of having this anti desitter they have a desitter space right. and how this fits in the string theory setup. So right. I think they just assume that if a vacuum exists where these, um, again, where these uh, uh, internal manifold can be made small enough, then mm -hmm. it can happen. Okay. I mean, it's just one solution. Yeah, thank you. Go I ahead. have a question. Um, so you said that there's the non there's always a non susy counterpart to these brains and those should decay. Is yes. there a time scale on which that would happen? And since we haven't seen, to my knowledge, any evidence of supersymmetry experimentally, does that mean we could be the non susy counterpart? Um, yes, it is. It is. Um, let's say it is expected that uh, we should find a way out where there is um, uh, stable enough uh, non-supersymmetric vacuum. I mean, our the Sitter universe may still be metastable, and at some point it may decay, but on scales long enough that the universe can evolve during those scales. Um, uh, in this case, to be honest, uh, there was one uh, solution uh, that uh, uh, is the end point of these decays, where all the brains basically have puffed out and you reobtain the sphere. That solution doesn't have perturbative or non-perturbative uh, solution uh, that we could find. Um, it's not easy to find non-perturbative solutions. You have to choose a particular brain that you can claim uh, is the bubble that nucleates. Uh, however, there is uh, some recent work that uh, uh, discusses bubbles of nothing, where basically, if there's no geometric obstruction, uh, one dimension can just shrink to zero. So this sphere could, in principle, just shrink to zero. And so the whole uh, space time would become nothing. That's the, the bubble, the, the decay. And it has some interesting uh, geometric, uh, geometric properties um, and, and consequences. Um, this is not what would happen in, in our non supersymmetric universe. But that was just to, to since you asked uh, if there can be um, uh, like an example where that is stable. Uh, yes, there was one example that was stable, but we cannot rule it out unless we show that also these bubbles of nothing cannot uh, cannot happen. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, let me start talking about black holes now, and I will just go on uh, for uh, as much time as I have, um, and that will be enough. <laughs> um, black holes uh, play a role already in this swampland uh, in swampland uh, uh, discussion uh, because uh, uh, black holes uh, and black hole evaporation uh, would, for example, uh, not conserve uh, uh, global charge. Because if we send a particle that has a certain global charge into the black hole, uh, this global charge is not, global means it's not, there's no gauge, there's no electric field for this global charge. Uh, there's no electric field causing polarization. And so there's no way we can measure this, this global charge from outside of the black hole. And when the black hole discharges completely and evaporates, there will be no a remaining object with global charge. So there will be no global charge conservation. And so these, these black hole evolution and evaporation tells us that uh, um, uh, it, it, it makes sense. It gives us an argument for which uh, we, sh we expect there are none um, continuous global symmetries in quantum gravity. Um, other properties like uh, all charges in the spectrum must be realized, uh, uh, can also be seen by just like looking at two, um, two uh, black holes with different charge. Uh, they can just merge. And if one has positive charge, the other has negative charge, minus one, you, will, uh, you can create a an object with any charge uh, whatsoever. So, you know, it makes sense that once you have black hole into your spectrum, uh, you can create uh, particles of any charge not just like in a standard model, we have the electron that has charge plus one. Uh, this is telling us that if we want to couple the standard model to gravity, at some point we will need particles of any charge. Um, and again, the weak gravity conjecture tells us that gravity is the weakest force. Um, gravity is the weakest force means that uh, uh, there exists, there must exist in our spectrum even at low energies or at some point before 
completing the theory to the UV uh, with the theory of gravity, there must exist particles for which the mass is smaller than their charge. And uh, for black holes, uh, because they are gravitational states like uh, bound states, uh, the bound is actually the opposite. The mass of a black hole is always greater or equal than its charge, total charge. The equal sign is only uh, realized in the case of supersymmetric or BPS black holes. And uh, if we want BPS black holes to evaporate, they need to emit their mass, uh, they decrease their mass and decrease their charge. But in order to preserve the, if they're BPS uh, and they start from M equal Q, Q to go to a state where M is greater than or equal Q, we need to have emission of particles of this, of this kind. So these uh, properties that we have seen arising from the Swampland uh, program are consistent and are justified by black hole uh, physics. And this is very, very interesting. Uh, I'm currently investigating uh, certain uh, limits of black hole solutions, again, in the context of, of, of uh, understanding the swampland. Uh, what happens if uh, we can uh, tune the entropy and the temperature of the black hole to zero infinity? Are these states still physical? Why aren't they physical? Is there some properties of the swampland conjectures that break down? That's a part of work in progress. Uh, and there's a question. Um, I can have particles of arbitrary charge. Uh, charge uh, has to be discrete. Um, the symmetry that I'm talking about here is a global symmetry. Uh, the electron uh, charge is a charge under a gauge field, so it would be a gauge symmetry. And those uh, by charge quantization are quantized. And so in, this is the framework I am, uh, I am uh, working on. Okay, um, if I have uh, 10 more minutes, maybe I can tell you something about the uh, information paradox. This is, um, um, to me, one of the greatest uh, um, achievements uh, of, of uh, our field uh, of uh, gravity, the, yeah, uh, high energy theoretical physics with, with uh, interest in quantum gravity. Um, what is the information, uh, the black hole information paradox? Um, right after uh, Bekenstein understood that uh, black holes satisfy a first law, similar to first law of thermodynamics, uh, Hawking was able to actually compute uh, the temperature of this thermodynamic state that the black hole should be in. So, taking a black hole of mass M and charge Q in a theory with a certain uh, electric field, the variation of the mass of the black hole is related to the variation of the entropy and the variation of the charge by a first law. This is the usual DE equal TDS in uh, thermodynamics. Uh, S is the entropy of the black hole, which scales proportionally to the area. This uh, area dependence is what inspired the holographic principle. The entropy of a system is the logarithm of its fundamental degrees of freedom. So it looks like the black hole degrees of freedom are described by its area, are captured by its area only, not by its volume. Um, the holographic principle developed through string theory, the ADS safety correspondence, um, has more to do with uh, a system uh, degrees of freedom being captured by the boundary of the space-time this system is in. But uh, it's the same idea. We can uh, describe uh, a system with uh, degrees of freedom in one dimension less. That's why it's holographic. Uh, in particular, in the ADS safety correspondence, that's been one of the greatest success of string theory, these one dimension less theory is a theory that has no gravity. So. The ADS safety correspondence allows us to describe gravity in an hyperbolic space in ADS through the boundary theory 
uh, a CFT, which has no gravity in it. That's making certain computation easier because then we can map certain, certain pro problems of gravity in a problem in a CFT. The problem, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm taking it to the low, but the problem with black hole evolution is that once we have a thermal state, the thermal state evaporates. The final state of evaporation is a purely radiation state. So we started with collapsing matter and we end up with pure radiation. By, as we said at the beginning, our collapsing quanta are described by unitary quantum field theory. How do we get a unitary process where we start with a certain uh, quanta and conserved quantum numbers and we end up with just radiation? Thermal radiation has no more information than its temperature. It seems that we've lost information. Uh, a proposal that the physicist uh, came up with right away was that actually this thermal radiation is a thermal a system of quantum fields. These quantum fields can still be entangled with each other. These entanglement can, be, can give us information. Why? Uh, let's take a pure state in quantum mechanics. A pure state is different from a mixed state because a pure state can be really written or described by um, a density matrix, which is of this form, a cat and a bra. What happens if we want to look at a subsystem of our pure state? Let's divide our system into pieces, system A, subsystem A and subsystem B. The subsystem B is the complement of A. If we only have access to one of the two subsystems, this system is no more a pure state. This system is, the subsystem is now described by a density matrix. This density matrix is exactly obtained by tracing the original state on all the, let's say, if we have a basis of states, we'll have a basis of the A subsystem. And so we trace the original density matrix only on some part of the subsystem. This gives us the entanglement entropy. The original system was in the pure state, the entanglement of one subsystem is equal to the entanglement entropy of its complement. In the case of the black hole, what's happening? We have the black hole, it's, it gets formed. After its formation, it starts to evaporate. Once it evaporates, the full system becomes part black hole, part radiation that has been emitted. This means that if we are an observer that is outside of the black hole, we have access to some of the radiation. We don't have access to the inside of the black hole. If we collect the radiation emitted by the black hole, we see that this radiation is in a mixed state and we can compute its entanglement entropy. This entanglement entropy is a measure of how much information we can access. The, um, If we look at the full black hole evolution, we expect that the entropy of the radiation that an observer gets from the outside has this form. At the beginning, there's no radiation. And so we have no, uh, there, there's no radiation, there's no entanglement entropy. The more radiation we collect, the more entanglement entropy uh, we measure. At a certain point, when the two subsystems become of the same size, that's when they are maximally entangled because we have access to exactly half of the system. If we increase the amount of system we have access to, so we get more than half of the system, the entanglement entropy should decrease because we actually physically have most of the degrees of freedom in our hand already. There's not much they can be entangled with because what's left after half of the system is just a smaller system. And so this is consistent because we expect that in a unitary evolution, once the black hole is completely evaporated, the final entropy, entanglement entropy is zero because we've recovered a pure state. This shape called the page curve is what's expected in a theory that describes a unitary evolution of the black hole. This is not what happens from if we just compute entanglement entropy as entropy of Hawking radiation. Because Hawking radiation only describes a system where the entropy keeps increasing. And the reason is that Hawking calculation that derives black hole thermodynamics assumes that we have a fixed black hole background with some quanta on top of it, some, some excitations of the background. This is like if we have 
is like when we have um, infinite reservoir. The mass of the black hole is not that are supposed to change in Hawking calculation. However, we know that if we want the black hole to fully evaporate, at some point, the mass of the black hole will become half of the original one. And so, you know, there will, it will not be any more an adiabatic process. To take into account conceptually how the change in this entanglement entropy happens took us from Hawking's uh, calculations in the 70s until 2019. And uh, I'm gonna skip this part. So I'll go, uh, I'll stay on the information paradox. Uh, what was the revolutionary uh, part? Uh, it had to do with, with holography. What was crucial was to understand how to compute this entanglement entropy of the Hawking radiation. What physicists did was to go and ask help to the CFT uh, picture. They took uh, a gravitational picture, so a space-time that has a black hole in it, and they considered a particular kind of space-time, again, this anti-de-sitter space. Anti-de-sitter space is a space that has a boundary. So we can, we can define a screen at the end that has a one dimension less. And uh, uh, an important uh, result of 2006 and 2007, started by Ryu and Takayanagi, was that uh, if we are interested in the entanglement entropy of a subsystem, a subsystem A of the full system, this full area is the whole boundary theory, all your universe at the boundary. If you just select a subsystem, this subsystem A lives in the boundary on this screen. But we can define an extremal surface that goes into the bulk. So we add one direction. This is what is called the bulk. And we can consider all the possible surfaces that are anchored in this boundary area A that go into the bulk and we extremize the surfaces. And the area of these surfaces is what captures the entanglement entropy of these fields. This is a revolutionary uh, relation. And uh, recently uh, in between 2014 and 2019 has been extended to the case of uh, uh, black hole, the presence where in, the, in the case where, where um, in the in the space time where we're describing a black hole, not just a, not just the bulk space time, and uh, it was realized people realized that actually there are two competing terms in this uh, in this uh, in this formula. What's happening physically is that there's two regimes of black hole evaporation an early time evaporation and a late time evaporation. This is the page curve that I discussed before. This is the uh, early times entanglement entropy of radiation that is captured by Hawking computation. It's, it keeps growing. And there's a late time behavior that's not captured by Hawking radiation. This late time behavior is coming from an additional contribution to the entanglement entropy that comes from a region that is this region here that is inside of the horizon. So after a certain time called page time, there, if we extremize these quantities, we get a new contribution that tells us that there is an extremal surface that's however inside the horizon and these degrees of freedom somehow are part of the um, Hawking radiation. This is, um, let's say, uh, holographic inspired definition of entanglement, generalized entropy. And this has been shown to reproduce correctly the page curve. So at a certain point, there's these island regions whose entanglement entropy is smaller than the Hawking entropy that explain why the page we can reproduce the page curve. 
and uh, these have been computed in uh, uh, explicit models, uh, one dimensions or two dimensions, um, where uh, some computation can actually be done. Um, they uh, there's a, like a recent uh, uh, efforts in trying to extend this to um, higher dimensional cases through uh, certain uh, brain scenarios and uh, I'm currently also working on uh, realizing this from a 10 dimensional geometry it's related to setup that are dual to conformal interfaces uh, the idea is to uh, produce a, a geometry where we can have uh, let's say a radiation region and uh, we can have the black hole evaporate in one of the directions and uh, because we have constructed this geometry from 10 dimensions we have control on them and we can actually see if we can compute these islands and show that they actually uh, give us a page curve um if i am a little late uh, i will leave this to the questions i just added it in case uh uh, you, uh, um, I had time or uh, you had questions. Uh, so let me just go to comments and open problems and we can discuss more later if you, if you would like. Um, so I hope I conveyed the idea that uh, uh, recent developments uh, have had a huge impact in our understanding of gravity as fundamental interaction. Um, they happen thanks to um, a lot of progress in string theory and holography. And uh, so I hope you agree with me that they are important tools that we should uh, we should keep exploring. Um, and there's a lot more that uh, now can be done. Um, I skip these, but uh, um, essentially uh, these quantum extremal islands need to be understood physically. W what are they? Why are they arising? And it seems that uh, in the gravitational picture, uh, in the space-time computation, they behave like wormholes. Um, they are wormholes that somehow change the way the space-time is entangled in, in our like uh, gravity path integral. Um, and uh, because of that, uh, it's, it's interesting uh, to, to study them. They seem, uh, they seem to, to they, they were dis disregarded uh, years ago because they lead to some inconsistencies uh, and we're trying to understand uh, what is their role. Um, this also opens uh, questions about how do we have to compute the gravity path integral. Uh, we can take a semi-classical geometry and then expand perturbatively. And uh, do we have to take wormholes into account and how? Um, I think that uh, for me, my perspective is that uh, I will try to construct more examples from string theory where we can actually compute things and see, and see what they tell us, because in the end, predictions is, is what uh, uh, we like in any any field uh, and that's all thank you very much for for your attention yeah, um, so we had a lot of questions during but uh, do we have any questions now especially starting from students if there are any I know we had a couple of student questions during as well how could we experimentally find strings um so um, one of the consequences that I think have been explored from the beginning is uh, um, the um, was the, the extra dimensions, right? Um, the, if, if we have extra dimensions of a certain size, at that point uh, there will be, uh, if we reach energies uh, uh, of the scale, uh, inverse scale of, of the radius of these small dimensions, we will have uh, uh, some, uh, we will reach uh, the uh, mass scale of some of the kaluza klein fields. And that would be a signal that uh, we have, uh, that these, these new particles we find uh, could be coming from these extra dimensions. Um, however, I think also maybe cosmologically, there's a, you know, there's um, certain configurations of cosmological strings or um, this kind of, of uh, um, cosmological like uh, scenarios where maybe one can relate to, uh, that to strings. But I think that uh, um, extra dimensions and new particles is still the best way to go. <laughs> Uh, to find something new. Um, it, it maybe, yeah, maybe that's why I'm so excited about these uh, low energy perspectives, because it doesn't require us to necessarily find new particles. We can uh, 
find new principles and then test these new principles, maybe in different scenarios or like uh, maybe still with accelerators, but with a different uh, idea in mind, not just like trying to heat higher energies. So. I mean, that's the entire spirit of the of, of the of the low energy program, right, Alessandra, right? I mean, that's, a, and of course, it's not developed enough to be able to point to specific scenarios, which you just mentioned, but at some point, the hope is they will be there. And uh, we'll render books like David Lindley's book, The End of Physics, uh, a little less uh, uh, important, you know, the idea that uh, we will get to the point where we can no longer test physics and physics becomes philosophy right so that's that's isn't, the, isn't the, there that's a book the, like that in every generation of physicists right yes exactly <laughs> <laughs> yes no it's true it's true it's true to know that that's a possibility and and try to find ways to avoid that right i see a question from larry hi yeah thank you so much for the talk super interesting stuff um um about um I, I think we should just be talking more um about the page curve uh stuff um it, it, is it right to picture that as uh, basically taking a step further away from classical in, in a semi-classical a less semi-classical picture yeah yes yes um uh, yes it's it's um the first uh, progress beyond the Hawking uh, calculation yeah. And uh, um, it's telling us, for example, that these uh, we don't have to look at the space time just classically. Like these, the fact that there is a certain causal contribution or like, a, uh, yes, mm -hmm. information content in a region of space time that's physically disconnected from the one you have access to, I think that is something that we haven't had before. Yeah. So and um, yeah. So you skipped over it for time, but is this a full explanation for for firewalls or for the lack of firewalls? Um, the firewall proposal was getting inconsistencies in uh, um, the entanglement of Hawking radiation because yeah. they were they were um, and it's related to the islands directly. They were assuming that basically, how do you describe Hawking radiation? Where does the radiation come from? Uh, and the entanglement. It comes from a pair production near the horizon. Mm -hmm. One of the particles falls in, one of the particles falls out because they are pair produced, they're entangled. And at some point you will get this particle coming out because you will have already gotten some uh, some uh, radiation before this other particle comes out. It's you. It will look like you have more entanglement than you can in this description. What's happening here? It's telling you that you have some of this entanglement even before these particles have come out, because you're capturing it from this island, and so. There's no need to physically connect, wait for the particle to come out to get its information. Um, right. So it's it's uh, it's that's how they evade the the the, the yeah, firewall. Yeah, that paradigm. makes a lot of sense. And just a really really quick follow up about the islands, uh, about the extremal islands, and uh, especially as identifying them as wormholes. Does this? have some connection to that idea before that I think we've talked about years ago of, of this this e, EPR equals ER? Yes, 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 it yes, does? yes. Okay. That is e, ER equal EPR. Okay. Yes, okay. yes, 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 yes. The, awesome. That is the first wormhole. And then, um, yes, these, these wormholes are Euclidean wormholes, but the idea of entanglement spread by wormholes is ER equal EPR. Mm -hmm. ER equal EPR is yeah. a wormhole that has, that connects, that, that produces entanglement. Right, right, right. Okay, awesome, yeah. thank you. Uh, I see another question from Tony, I think. Yeah, if I may, if, if all the students are finished with theirs. Um, uh, Alessandra, I just wanted to get your, as someone working in this field, I, I, I sort of wanted to get your expert perspective uh, on other approaches to quantum gravity. You know, I'm thinking of Smolin, Rovelli, and others, you know, loop quantum gravity, et cetera. Uh, you showed us your list of the things you love and hate about string theory. Uh, of course, other theories have the same thing. I'd love your perspective on, on those approaches, uh, particularly as they pertain, relate to the, the approaches you're involved in. Yes, so the um, com coming from, uh, um, 
I would say uh, the traditional quantum field theory approach to interactions, I think, uh, is at best extended by string theory. String theory is the closest uh, uh, extension of uh, our world uh, description of fundamental interactions that we can get and still describe gravity. In other approaches, uh, uh, I think that the, um, there's a much more um, revolutionary point of view, I would say, when uh, um, discretizing space-time. Uh, and uh, uh, I mean, it could be that at some point the, one loses the idea of geometric space-time. I mean, we don't know how to compute things in a, a high temperature state uh, phase of string theory. Uh, what, who knows what could happen there? Uh, but in these different approaches like loop quantum gravity, et cetera, it's much harder to compute uh, to compute uh, um, uh, or to face uh, problems uh, that are relevant for low energy physics. Uh, they can, they, there's an interesting attempt at describing the singularity, uh, the Big Bang singularity. Uh, this is something that if one has access to a quantum form of space time, maybe it's easier to address. Uh, in string theory, we can have many, many um, semi-classical geometries, uh, many examples, uh, but there are certain phases of string theory that we cannot uh, directly access uh, and uh, they can work more easily with the singular uh, singularities in the space time. Uh, they can work maybe, uh, they have a way of defining the processes at the Planck scale. Uh, for us, it's basically trans-Planckian scattering of strings that produces black holes and then evaporate and it's deeper in dynamics. Uh, um, the problem is that string theory can give you a lot of, uh, exam um, of, uh, of or let's say a broad perspective on phenomena that you see in the world around you and some other attempts are still too far from the low energy limit to, to be useful, I would say, in discussing physics like right. the standard model or cosmology. Yeah, thank you, but, I understand. Uh, uh, that's but I mean, um, I think, I think it's, it's worth you know, exploring yeah. every direction. Right. I'm not asking you to pick sides. I was just wanting to get <laughs> no, no, your no. Actually, no, no, no. We have an expert here in Munich, uh, uh, Daniel Oriti, and uh, he's, uh, he's, uh, he's, he has many, many interesting yeah. uh, perspectives. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's just like, I think we're still uh, facing different problems, let's say. Yeah. So we cannot uh, ever let talk to each other uh, on a particular problem and say, oh, my theory says that, your approach says that, yeah, I'd like to call it approach. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It would be nice to reach that stage. Yeah. Okay, let's do one more question. I see one from Charles. Yeah, I've been out using the chat. Oh, yeah. the whole time. I didn't want to walk up and interrupt. Um, so I'm kind of missing the take, and you've explained it, I just don't understand it. I'm missing the takeaway about quantum information paradox here. Specifically, you know, the, the pop science understanding of it is often phrased as, well, either conservation of information has to go or the concept of an event horizon has to go, which both are kind of fundamental predictions of uh, QFT slash you know, quantum mechanics and GR. So is this, it, does this actually resolve the quantum information paradox or does it provide just a new way to look at it. Uh, that's what I'm not getting here from this picture. Uh, it does not resolve completely the information paradox because the information paradox will be resolved when someone tells you, ex predicts exactly theoretically what is the information in the Hawking radiation and this we don't have. Uh, but uh, the, how do you say, uh, step zero uh, question is like, can, do we have the tools to address that problem in our theory, or we are lacking some conceptual issues before. Uh, this was the, the, the problem that has been resolved now. It's like, uh, um, how can the black hole evaporate unitarily? How can entanglement really resolve the information paradox? Um, the, 
I think that the way you phrased the information paradox was related to the firewall uh, paradigm, right? Uh, to the yes, uh, and I think if you if you could like explain that just a little bit, because like even I don't really understand what I said. I, I mean, I get the basic <laughs> idea. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just uh, just just look at the at the geometry so with gravity um uh, what uh, uh, helps me look at the problem is like knowing that like you first need to 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 figure out the observer you need to figure out the where the person is and so uh, there's two pe people here there's one person that is far away from the black hole like uh, us uh, far away from the black hole that have done mergers etc uh, and we are the ones that receive the Hawking radiation. And there's another person that we probably don't like very much that's going through the black hole and will eventually die at a singularity in any case. That person describes physics the way in his reference system, reference frame, they see the, uh, the black hole, uh, the from more and more uh, clo closer and closer, uh, but the laws of physics should be the same. Uh, this person will fall in the black hole and then will be evaporated out. Uh, the issue of firewalls is like based on the assumption that if you just look at classical gravity, Classical gravity tells you that if you're falling in the near in the horizon, the geometry that you see while you fall into the horizon is flat space. So when you fall in the horizon, semi-classical gravity tells you you don't see the horizon. We may go through a large black hole horizon right now and not even feel it. This is the, the idea of, of, uh, of uh, the classical view of black hole. However, we know that the black hole evaporates. So at the horizon, there's something going on. There's a pair production of, of particles. Why? If we pair produce particles, one with positive energy, one with negative energy, the one with um, negative energy will be able to escape the horizon because it's produced uh, um, outgoing from the horizon and it will be collected by, our, by us far away from the black hole. This presence of these particles in the near horizon somehow destroy the picture of having a flat space, an empty space in the horizon. So the viral paradox tells us that if we have this particle production near the horizon, and we expect that this particle production, once the black hole evaporates, will contain all the information of the infolding matter. Then, once we want to describe this, this like, or we trace back these modes in the near horizon, the fact that there is this particle production tells us that there's actually a lot of energy in the near the horizon. It's not at all flat space. This is just by requiring that we do have entanglement structures such that we can recover all the information of, Oking, uh, of, of the infolink quanta. So the final state is a pure state. Um, if we do not require this, we would violate the so-called like uh, strong uh, subadditivity um, of uh, entanglement entropy. So it's really a play on like uh, on what subsystem is entangled with what. And uh, the assumption there is that you have to wait for all the Hawking radiation to come out to recover the full information. So you have to wait for the black hole horizon to shrink completely to get the information. And here we're saying that the entanglement entropy of the radiation is not just captured semi-classically by the physical fields we have at hand, but is captured also by a contribution that comes from a region inside the horizon. And 
this is the caveat. This is telling us that somehow the structure of uh, uh, information in uh, a dynamical gravity background is more subtle than what we thought. And again, this is recent results and we need to understand, you know, how to formulate the rules of quantum information in a dynamical background. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I hope I didn't confuse you much more than, well, <laughs> than before. I'm pretty, con I, I know that we all want to go and I, so I'm going to hold off my questions, but I do think that was a really great uh, explanation. I know you actually probably said most of that before and I completely went over my head and this, some of it went over my head, but most of it I got. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a, um, I'm not the most expert, so I, 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 it's hard for me probably to compete in the, in the easiest uh, possible way, but uh, uh, if you can get some of it, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very satisfied. Yes, so thank thanks you. Thanks for the questions. Uh, okay, so uh, I think we'll close out the question. Uh, Ali, thank you so much for um, coming and giving us a talk, and I'll send you a link to the recording later if you'd like to have it. Thank you very much for the invitation. It was, uh, it was very, very nice to, to meet you all. And I hope there will be in the future a chance to stop by <laughs> in Wonderful. person. All right. Thank you for staying up so late for us. Yeah, uh, for Alessandra, <laughs> grazie tanto. È stato uh, molto interessante. Grazie. Grazie a voi. Mi fa piacere. Buona Bye. giornata. Buon pomeriggio. It's great to see you, Ali. Hi, guys. See you soon. Bye. Bye.